Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm Zach Peterson. I'm a technical consultant with Altium. And today we're gonna to continue talking about transmission lines. And specifically, we're gonna talk about input impedance. So if you remember the previous two videos that we've been doing on these topics, first we looked at the difference between characteristic and equivalent impedance. They're not the same thing. Then we looked a little deeper at just the characteristic impedance of a transmission line. So characteristic impedance doesn't tell the whole story. What you really need to look at is the input impedance in a transmission line, and then specifically what happens at the end of a transmission line where it reaches its load. So there's a lot to get through. Let's go ahead and get started. To get started with looking at input impedance, I'm just gonna redraw the typical circuit model that's used to represent a transmission line. So here, just for the moment, let's consider an AC source, and then I've got my R, and I've got my L, and then I've got my G, which represents my dielectric losses, and then I've also got my C, for my capacitance in my transmission line. And then down here at the other end, we have a load impedance. I've drawn it as a resistor, but in general, it's an impedance. We'll just call it Z sub L. So this circuit model is our transmission line. In a transmission line, the line is long enough. This is what makes transmission line a transmission line. The line is long enough that we need to worry about the propagation of a signal. And I'm drawing a digital signal here, but could be an analog signal. So it could just be an AC signal being sourced here from this source. And how it travels down this line and interacts with all the different portions of the line along the way to eventually reach the load. What is the impedance that affects this signal once it's injected into the line right here from the source? Is it the characteristic impedance, Z sub zero, equals R plus I omega L over G plus I omega C? Is it this value? Is it really just the load impedance? So Z sub L, or is it something else? Well, the answer is this new concept that we're gonna introduce called the input impedance. So the input impedance is just the impedance seen here at this interface between wherever my source comes into the line and then the line itself. And so the input impedance depends on the load impedance, Z sub L, but it also depends on the characteristic impedance Z or more generally written Z sub zero. This is important because it brings up another important concept called termination. And so as we'll see in just a moment, when the load input impedance matches the characteristic impedance, then we don't really have to worry about the input impedance. The input impedance is gonna be the same across these two values. So it's gonna be equal to Z sub zero, which also just happens to be equal to Z sub L. So let's look at input impedance and look at the equation specifically for input impedance, and then hopefully we will be able to see why termination is important. When I have my source here, and I have some impedance, and maybe it's connected to another impedance here, we'll just call this our load, coming back around, I need to define my input impedance seen right here at this interface. So I have my source, and I wanna know what the uh, impedance is seen by a signal entering right here at the source and traveling into my line and then eventually over to my load. So the input impedance is defined as Z sub zero equals the load impedance plus the characteristic impedance and it's multiplied by this hyperbolic tangent term and this is where we now need to bring back in the propagation constant and the length of the line. So here we have our length of our line L. And then here we have some terms in the denominator, Z sub L, and then we have another hyperbolic tangent term. If you remember from the previous clip, you'll know that I said that when Z sub zero equals Z sub L, what do we have here for the input impedance? Z sub N is gonna be equal to, we have a Z sub zero, and then we have another Z sub zero, so these terms, and these terms in the denominator will all cancel out. So we've got a Z sub zero here, a Z sub zero here. This entire fraction is equal to one. And so what will happen here is you'll have Z sub in equal to Z sub zero equal to Z sub L. So this condition is sometimes called just impedance matching. 
It's also just sometimes called termination. So what this tells you is that as long as my source impedance, Z sub S, is also equal to Z sub zero, and Z sub zero is also equal to Z sub L, there won't be any reflection here in the signal that I try and inject into this portion of the system. Now similarly, once the signal gets over here to the interface between the line and my load, there also won't be any reflection here at this point. So remember, when you source a signal into a circuit and when you source it into a transmission line, you want the signal, meaning all of that power contained in that signal, to get over here to the load. You want all of that power to enter the load. That means you don't want any reflection here and you don't want any reflection here, ideally. So this is why this condition is important because it eliminates these reflections here and then here. In a real system involving digital components, what you generally have is this value is actually very high. So it's something on the order of mega ohms, so millions of ohms. But Z sub zero is normally not mega ohms, it's normally 50 ohms. How do we make it so that this interface right here, where we have this interface between the end of the transmission line and the load, how do we make it so that this impedance looks like 50 ohms instead of mega ohms? Well, what we do is we apply termination. So termination just simply means either I add in some resistance in series or in parallel so that the equivalent impedance here seen at the input of the load is now equal to my transmission line impedance of 50 ohms. If you go back to your basic circuit theory where you're doing equivalent circuits in parallel, you should know that if I have a impedance here and I have another impedance in parallel and this impedance is, let's say, on the order of mega ohms, what does this impedance need to be in order for the equivalent arrangement here to be equal to 50 ohms. Well, this resistance just basically needs to be about 50 ohms. And you might say, well, hey, Zach, I mean, you know, I'm putting 50 ohms in parallel with mega ohm. Why does that get me back to 50 ohms? And that's because you have these two loads in parallel and you should know that the equivalent impedance uh, at the input of the load, ZEQ, is equal to one over 50 plus one over Let's say it's a mega ohm. So this is 0 0.000001. This is an extremely small number compared to this, which is uh, 0 0.02. If you just crank this, crank out this math on your calculator and then invert this to get ZEQ, this comes out to be like 50 point, you know, 000. It's just a small fraction at the end of it. Who cares? It's not even important. It's so small, it doesn't even matter. So this gets, basically gets you back to 50 ohms by having this parallel termination. So this is one of the reasons why with differential pairs and then with single-ended signals, what you'll see at the load end of the line when a termination resistor is applied is that it is applied in parallel. And that's the reason for doing this. That's what then causes your Z sub L to be now Z sub zero, this to be Z sub zero, and then this whole fraction to then reduce back to one, and now you're back at this condition. Now, what about at the source end? If you know anything about CMOS uh, circuits, then at the source end, you'll know that Z sub S is usually about zero ohms. It's actually very low impedance. So they have low impedance sources. You have high impedance input at a load. How would you resolve this? Well, the typical strategy then to increase Z sub zero, or sorry, uh, Z sub S at zero ohms up to 50 ohms would be to add in some resistance. How do you add in some resistance? You just put it in series. So here at the input, I'll just redraw this momentarily, I would wanna put a series resistor right here. So this would be 50 ohms. So now my Z sub source is zero ohms plus 50 ohms gets me to 50 ohms. So now I have perfect matching here at the input and then at the load end. In reality, with modern components, you don't always have to apply this 50 ohm uh, resistor at the source, and you don't always have to apply this 50 ohm resistor, or in the case of differential pairs, maybe it's a 100 ohm resistor at the load. Some components use what's called on-die termination. So the termination resistor is already built into the chip, and 
the output impedance at the source is already set to 50 ohms. So um, a great example is like with some Texas Instruments uh, microcontrollers, like on the wireless output, uh, going for an RF signal over to like an antenna. I bring that specific component up because I work with it all the time on a client design. The output impedance on that RF source is already set to 50 ohms. So I don't need to add in this, this resistor on the output. So this is one of those things where you just need to check the data sheet to make sure that you don't need to necessarily add in these resistors on the output. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll have a certain guide on what resistor you need to calculate and it really just depends on the signaling standard that you're working with and it depends on what the impedances are on the die on that component versus the target that you're trying to hit for your specific transmission line. So far we've been talking all about digital signals and with digital signals you don't generally use this equation. The reason is because gamma here is generally only defined for a single frequency. So if you go back to the previous video on transmission line impedance, on, on characteristic impedance, I talked briefly about the propagation constant. Now, the propagation constant is actually a function of frequency. Just like the characteristic impedance doesn't saturate to square root over L, you know, square root of L over C, the propagation constant doesn't saturate to square root of LC. So it is also not constant. It is a function of frequency. So because of that, this is actually an equation that's generally used with RF design because at, uh, in RF designs, you're generally working with just one frequency or a very narrow range of frequencies. So it's much easier to calculate one specific value for Z sub in. And that's really important because sometimes what you do with uh, RF designs is you actually have uh, different transmission line sections that are cascaded and you need to know the input impedance at each of those uh, interfaces between different lines. That's gonna determine whether or not your signal reflects off of those interfaces. Same thing with digital circuits. We care about the reflection just like we do in RF circuits. Hopefully that uh, clears up some of the, the, the terminology and really illustrates what happens when a signal actually travels onto the line. It's not just interacting with this uh, characteristic impedance of the transmission line, it's actually also interacting with the load. So last thing to consider here is what happens with the hyperbolic tangent function and specifically what happens to the line when it's very, very long. So let me just rewrite this equation because I got a little messy there for a moment. So. One of the things that you'll hear uh, brought up quite often is what happens when the line gets very long. So what happens when my transmission line gets to L equals infinity? Hyperbolic tangent is defined as hyperbolic sine divided by hyperbolic cosine. What that means is that if my line gets very, very long, this value or this function, hyperbolic tangent, evaluates to one. Same thing down here hyperbolic tangent will evaluate to one. And so I can essentially just ignore those on very long lines. And so what happens here? Well, I have ZL plus Z zero divided by ZL plus Z sub zero. So again, this entire fraction just evaluates to one. Just ignore it. So on a very long transmission line, what happens is the input impedance is really just the, the characteristic impedance. We don't even care what's happening at the load right now. The input impedance is just the characteristic impedance. And that's because the load end of the line is so far away that when the signal enters the line, the only thing that it's interacting with is the transmission line. And so that's why only the characteristic impedance appears in this input impedance when the line reaches out to infinity. So this again should illustrate why we care so much about the propagating behavior of an electrical signal. When there's propagation at a finite velocity, which is exactly how electrical signals move around the board, we only care about the, the amount of the impedance that is within the spatial extent of the signal. So if the signal only exists at the beginning of the line, the only impedance that matters is the impedance at the beginning of the line. And so this is why we often talk about transmission lines in terms of their length. The length does matter and it is gonna determine the input impedance. One thing that you can do uh, with that equation is you can actually plug in different values for propagation constant and load impedances and characteristic impedances. And you can figure out some special cases of when the input impedance is zero, when it's infinity, when it's exactly Z sub zero or some fraction of it. And those are all important conditions in RF design. We have a lot of videos to get through because you know everyone's been leaving so many great questions. But one of the things I will try and get to um, in an upcoming video 
is looking at RF design and how input impedance plays an important role in RF design. If you want to learn more about input impedance and specifically the input impedance of cascaded circuit networks and cascaded transmission lines, go look in the description. There's a link to a blog. That link will contain a bit of an explanation about how input impedance is used in cascaded networks and cascaded transmission lines, meaning like I have different transmission lines arranged one after the other on my circuit board or different circuit networks arranged one after the other on my circuit board. Okay, everybody, thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more videos, hit the subscribe button. Help us hack that YouTube algorithm. And if you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section. I do my best to get to all your comments and questions. And if you ever want to see a specific video, again, just leave it in the comment section. We'll add it to our list. The list is already growing because everybody's been asking such great questions and we'll do our best to fit them into our schedule. For now, go into the links in the description. You'll see a free trial link for Altium Designer. You can download it, you can try it out, see if it works for you. Thanks everybody and uh, don't forget to call your fabricator.